I'm John Morley, a geriatrician and professor of medicine at St. Louis University in St. Louis. For the next few minutes, I'm going to entertain you by giving you a brief but spectacular preview of what COVID-19 is like in older people. Pandemics have been around since the beginning of time. We recognize that pandemics such as the Black Death killed 200 million people and the Spanish flu in 1918 to 1920 killed 50 million people. During my lifetime, uh, since I was born in 1946, I have seen more than 10 uh, epidemics that have made a major difference. Uh, this includes polio and measles while I was young, Hong Kong flu and Asian flu, when I started in medical school, hepatitis A or Australian antigen was a major pandemic affecting many, many people. Then came the Marburg virus. Subsequently, we saw HIV, which actually has killed between 40 and 50 million people already. Then came SARS, which has killed, killed around about 200,000 people, which is equivalent to what we've seen so far with COVID-19. Then came medical uh, uh, Middle East respiratory syndrome and Ebola. We have to compare epidemics like COVID to influenza. So in 2017 to 2018, the United States had a bad ep influenza epidemic. Over 49 billion, million people had influenza that year. Uh, 960,000 were admitted to hospital and 79,000 died. Compare this to COVID-19, where about 1 million people have had it in the United States, and at this stage, greater than 70,000 have died. It's important also to recognize that plagues take their toll on doctors. So, so through Slickledes, uh in the 5th century Anth uh, Athens uh, uh, epidemic, pointed out that there was a particularly high mortality among doctors, and this remains true in the COVID e epidemic today. When we look at the COVID epidemic and to decide to look at basically uh, what its causes are, we realize that the ACE2 receptor is spread throughout the body, and therefore the effects of the COVID-19 are throughout the body. When we look at the beginnings, we know this starts with a dry cough, sore throat, mostly a fever, but in many older people, there is no fever. There may be chills, a shortness of breath, hypoxia and respiratory failure. When we look at the central nervous system, fatigue is common. And then in older people, falls seem to be fairly common as a presenting feature. Obviously, this can be associated with delirium, which can be very common in the older person as they develop their inflammatory cytokines, headaches, encephalopathy, and stroke or other central nervous system presentations. At the level of the liver, hepatitis is not rare. At the heart level, we see myocarditis, myocardial infarction, chest pain, and heaviness. In the periphery, we can see chillblains, which are the so-called COVID toes now, which are caused by peripheral vascular disease, causing clotting in the periphery, deep vein thrombosis, which can lead to pulmonary embolus. Kidney injury occurs towards the end of the COVID-19 period when people are very ill. We also see diabetic ketoacidosis because COVID-19 can destroy the islets of Langerhans and people with type 2 diabetes. We see inflammation of the colon, colitis, which can lead to diarrhea. Uh, and we can also see anosmia, decreased taste, and anorexia. And in the muscles, myalgia and muscle wasting are not unusual. We also will get with the increased inflammatory cytokines, hyperalbuminemia. Anemia. If we put the anorexia, the hyperalbuminemia together with the muscle wasting, we have cachexia. Many people with COVID-19 are immobilized either on a ventilator or with the illness for a long period of time. This leads to sarcopenia and recovery can take a few months to a year or more from the sarcopenia. People with dementia who develop COVID-19 
just often don't understand why they need to socially isolate. And in nursing homes particularly, this is very different, difficult to keep the people apart from one another. Obviously, if you have dementia, you're more likely to become confused, more likely to have delirium, have fear, become helpless, uh, have anger, depression, and denial. Often when older people go to the hospital with dementia and a infection, they get themselves tied down, physically restrained. I should point out to you that this is torture. And I hope all of you learn from what I'm saying today that physicians do not use torture. So please avoid physical restraints. Social support is very important in the time of COVID with people with dementia. They often want to know where, who, where are their friends, why can't they be with their family, who will help them, and obviously they need help taking their medications. Dementia often puts large strain on caregivers, and when it's put together with COVID-19, this can be even worse. We need to remember that prevention is the important part of getting over COVID-19 pandemic, and the starting point is to wear a mask. Remember that wearing a mask on the whole protects other people, not the wearer. And if you have no mask, the droplets, as you can see here from the New England Journal article, travel a fair distance, whereas if you're wearing a mask, the droplets do not travel nearly as far. Um, notice that it, a mask gives very little extra protection of, from, for the person wearing it. That's not true of the N95 mask, which is very protective. Also, older people, we have to recognize, often lip read, and therefore having a way that they can see your lips through the mask with a plastic mouthpiece it may be a very useful thing to do. When it comes to uh, ageism and COVID-19, we have heard the term boomer remover used throughout the United States and, and United Kingdom. And we have to recognize that many people consider older people easily put aside. So I'd like you to look around the periphery of this uh, slide. You can see that um, Mr. Trump, the Dalai Lama, Pope Francis and Queen Elizabeth are all well over 70. And I don't think anyone would say that they are not highly functional people at this stage. In Italy, with 23% of the population is 65 or older, some hospitals used chronologically age-based cutoffs to ration ventilators. This is sometimes called distributed justice, and it's a form of ageism and a very hostile form of ageism. Many healthy younger adults initially ignored recommendations to socially isolate and protect their older relatives. This would be the neglectful form of ageism. And then Governor Dan Patrick suggested that older people, including himself, would volunteer to die so Americans don't lose our whole country. That would be benevolent ageism. And when we find counting is done we, and counting cases of COVID-19, Often the cases and deaths that occur in nursing homes are somehow ignored, again, a form. So finally, I would like to congratulate all of you on the journey you're making in medicine. I realize that at the time of COVID-19, it is sometimes very difficult. And so I thought I'd leave you with the message of why medicine is so enjoyable. Medicine is fundamentally about serving humanity. This alone makes it a really important profession. Also, it's about excellence. We will spend all our life learning to do new things, and we have to be up for that challenge. We have to recognize that equality is important and that all persons are entitled to the best medical care, you can, uh, and you cannot discriminate. Perhaps the most exciting for all of you is the new knowledge that you're going to come uh, to. In your career, you will learn to work alongside artificial intelligence, and there will be more ways to cure people than you could ever have imagined. And then finally, medicine is a pure joy. You become friends with your patients and you make them happy. I personally find dealing with older people perhaps the greatest joy of all. Geriatrics and medicine is the most enjoyable of 
the professions. Thank you all very much.